This is CBN News Watch. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm George Thomas. President Trump says America isn't in a trade war with China because we lost that war long ago. Instead, he is trying to restore fairness by correcting America's trade deficit with China. China is retaliating, and some fear what that will mean for American farmers and manufacturers. Jennifer Wishon has more from Washington. When you're already 500 billion down, you can't lose, the president tweeted, referring to the U.S. trade deficit with China. We can't continue to allow this to happen, where hundreds of billions of dollars is taken out of our country and our system. He's asked his U.S. trade representative to consider slapping an additional 100 billion in tariffs on Chinese goods. That's on top of 50 billion in tariffs he announced earlier this week. We can't be taken advantage of any longer. That prompted China to announce it was taxing 50 billion worth of American goods, including a number of agriculture products like soybeans, beef and corn, along with planes, cars and chemicals. It's a tit for tat between the world's two largest economies that's raising fears of a trade war, a worry that's hit stocks hard and has many farmers especially concerned. But administration officials say Americans shouldn't be worried because neither country has actually taken action yet. Technically, both countries have just proposed tariffs. There's nothing enacted. Instead of going into effect immediately, the president's tariff proposals will be put out for public comment for a period of months, giving the two sides plenty of time to negotiate. China created this problem, not President Trump, but we finally actually have a president who's willing to stand up and say enough is enough. We're going to stop the unfair trade practices. Heading into the midterm elections, some conservatives worry all this trade talk will distract Americans from the improving economy and benefits people are feeling from the Trump tax cuts. I am already using my extra money to spoil my grandsons just a little bit more. White House officials say their goal is growing the economy. And if the president can tear down trade barriers and get both sides to play by the rules, this can have a great ending. Jennifer Wishheim, CBN News, Washington. Thank you, Jennifer. Here's a look at some of the other headlines we're following in the CBN newsroom. Facebook says most of its 2.2 billion users have probably had their data compromised. CEO Mark Zuckerberg says Facebook is shutting down the ability to search for users by phone number and email addresses. He says users have likely had their information stolen this way. Zuckerberg will testify before Congress next week. President Trump breaks his silence about adult film actress Stormy Daniels. In his first public comments, the president said he did not know anything about the $130,000 payment his attorney made to Daniels for her silence. Daniels claims, she, Daniels claims she has had an affair with the president. The White House denies it. Trump made those comments while boarding Air Force One in West Virginia. The president traveled to the state to promote his tax overhaul plan, but quickly changed the script and talked about the country's immigration laws. You saw him there throw away his uh, script. He linked immigration to an increase in violence and rapes and claimed Democrats are embracing policies to secure immigrant votes. You can find these and other stories at CBNNews.com. For the first time, the Trump administration is publicly blaming the Russian government for cyber attacks on the United States' power grid. The administration's charges, those attacks stretch back at least two years. CBN's national security correspondent, correspondent Eric Rosales shows us what's being done to protect this vital lifeline. While most news attention regarding Russia focuses on the interference of the 2016 presidential election, there are other ways the bear is attacking the United States. Inside President Trump's administration's latest sanctions come this startling accusation. Moscow is targeting America's power grid. Like in Pearl Harbor in December 7th, we were attacked with airplanes and torpedoes coming out of Pearl Harbor. I believe the next December 7th uh, won't, won't be that. It will be rolling blackouts with uh, the Russians turn off our energy. Representative Don Bacon sits on the House Homeland Security Committee. He says right now credible intelligence shows the Russians are inside our energy grid with the goal cutting power in a time of crisis, not only creating chaos, but making it difficult for us to respond. 
and the Kremlin has proven it can do it. During the last two years, Russian hackers took down power plants inside Ukraine, leaving thousands in the dark. From a prioritization standpoint, protecting the grid from cyber attacks uh, is substantially high on our priority list. Energy Secretary Rick Perry told lawmakers that cyber attacks were, quote, literally happening thousands of times a day. Hackers get in by using spear phishing emails, fake messages that come from a known sender that contain malicious links or documents. Once inside energy sector networks, hackers move to gain information, like how control systems work. Perry reassured lawmakers the threat is on his radar. Part of his effort is a newly created office to bolster cybersecurity and energy security efforts. We are fortunate that we haven't had a major consequence of attacks, and thus far we have been successful in identifying. Part of this analysis involves modeling, information sharing, and monitoring. Congressman Bacon adds we need to let the Russians know there will be a counterpunch for their actions. The time to respond and prepare is now, not the day or two before we were attacked. Protecting American electricity from cyber attacks is challenging, not just because the grid contains so many physical and computerized components, but also because it must operate 24 hours a day. Eric Rosales, CBN News. The leaders of Hamas say their protests against Israel have been peaceful. But critics say the Hamas assault on Israel's border is part of a larger war against the Jewish state. And as Chris Mitchell explains, they're getting plenty of help from outside sources in that war. Last week, 18 Palestinians died when Hamas operatives and their supporters ignored warnings by Israel and charged the border with Gaza. This week, young Gazans are collecting thousands of tires to burn. They know Israel plans to use live fire to protect the border, and the goal is to engulf the area in smoke and flames and obscure the soldiers' vision. Why would they risk their own lives when they have no chance of physically taking back the Arab villages lost in the 1948 war against Israel? Itamar Marquez is the director of the Palestinian Media Watch. Tragically, what they have learned is that dead Palestinians make for good PR for the Palestinian Authority and for Hamas. And that is what this is all about. They want Israel to be forced to fire. They want their people to cross the border into Israel, uh, to threaten Israelis, and to be shot and killed. Because that is what wins the war for them. Hamas couldn't pose such a threat to Israel without help. So who's helping them? Middle East analysts say, look first to Turkey and Iran. There are uh, Turkish organizations that collect money uh, for Hamas. We know that uh, the Iranians are also uh, sending uh, money in suitcases, uh, millions of dollars, in order to help uh, Hamas uh, survive a difficult economic period. Middle East analyst Ephraim Inbar says Turkey has a Sunni connection with Hamas, which was founded by the Muslim Brotherhood. And Shiite Iran uses Hamas as a Sunni beachhead against Israel. The Iranians, as well as the Turks, understand uh, the military power of uh, Israel. And uh, they un understand that Hamas cannot overcome uh, this military power only by a strategy of attrition. They want the Israelis eventually to get tired. And uh, their dream is that the real Israelis will leave their country. The Palestinians also hope to charge Israeli leaders with war crimes in the International Criminal Court. They're backed by the Arab League in that effort. Marcus says the Palestinians have another helper. International media outlets who don't report that Hamas is a terror group committed to Israel's destruction. And he draws an interesting parallel between President Trump's decision to send troops to the Mexican border and Israel's clash with Hamas. Now what's significant here is the Mexicans uh, who are gonna be facing armed National Guards now, they're not coming to commit terror. They're coming just to get a job, just to get a better life. Uh, the ones coming in from Gaza facing Israeli soldiers, they're coming to commit terror. They're coming because they say, we want your country. So-called march of return. 
Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, spring is here, and for some that means allergies. We'll show you how to create an allergy-free zone in your home. And welcome back to CBN News. When you see yellow dust all over your car, you know allergy season is here. Pollen is everywhere right now. Nearly one quarter of all Americans suffer from allergies. And if you're one of them, like I am, our health reporter, Lori Johnson, has some good news for you and for me. All of us breathe in tiny particles of pollen floating in the air. In the spring, it's from trees. Summertime means grass pollen, and in autumn, it's from weeds. For many of us, it's no big deal. But if our immune system overreacts to pollen, our body produces something called histamine, which triggers allergy symptoms. Wheezing, runny nose, watery eyes, uh, just a horrible situation. So we're going to get a one-day break from the pollen, but it is going to come roaring back. Meteorologist Patrick Rocky says you can know what to expect by watching the weather. This year's allergy season has been unusually bad. And one of the reasons is because we've had such a wet winter in many parts of the country that that just encourages things that produce pollen to grow. The worst city for allergies is Jackson, Mississippi, followed by Knoxville, Tennessee, then Chattanooga, McAllen, Texas, and Louisville. Some of the worst areas are in the South and the Mid-South, areas where you have a longer growing season, it gets warmer, and so the pollens can bloom for longer during the year. But another thing that makes them bad is you, you get big changes in the weather. You have big storm systems that move through, and so you'll go from high pressure to low pressure over a couple of days, and it's that change in pressure that can really make folks who have allergies miserable this time of the year. It's a good idea to check your local pollen forecast because it tells you how much pollen will be in the air that day. For instance, on rainy days there's less, but on windy days there's more. It also tells you what kind of pollen is in your area. You may not be sensitive at all to grass pollens, but it may be the tree pollens that get you. Dr. Greg Pendell says people with allergies will feel a lot better if they make a few changes, like closing the windows. We all like that fresh spring air to come in, but what's in that air? Pollen. So keep that out and use your air conditioning. The air conditioning helps to cool, dry, and clean the air, and that's good for people with allergies. Same thing in your car. Windows up, air conditioning on. Also, change your clothes when you come inside because you're likely covered in pollen. Don't forget to wash your skin and hair. I always tell my patients to keep an allergy-free zone in their house, and that should be the bedroom, because that's where you spend the most time and that's where you sleep. That means washing your bedding frequently in hot water. We change the sheets at least once a week um, because even though the windows are closed, pollen can still get in just by going in and out of the house. Using a neti pot or nasal irrigation will also help. Warm salt water gently rinses away all of the pollen trapped inside your nose and sinuses. I recommend it uh, at least once to twice daily. But it's not a drug, it's not a medicine, so you can't really overdo it. Pollen is at its worst from 5 to 10 in the morning, so if possible, wait until later to go out and wear an N95 mask for added protection. Over-the-counter medications can help, and Dr. Pendel recommends Claritin and Allegra. If those don't work, ask for a prescription. Allergy shots work the best. So the way the allergy shots work is that we give a very tiny but increasing amount of allergen and it increases the immune system's tolerance. So over time we can significantly decrease or even eliminate your symptoms altogether. Patients start off by getting a shot once a week but taper off to once every six weeks. If you have allergies now, but you didn't used to have them, you're not alone. Seasonal allergies are at an all-time high. Doctors know this for sure, but what they're not so sure about is why. There are three possible explanations. Number one, we're too clean, meaning our immune system is out of whack because we're not exposed to enough bacteria. Number two, we're too dirty 
meaning our bodies are reacting to being exposed to too many environmental toxins. And third, climate change is causing plants to produce three to five times more pollen than they used to. All uh, sound equally uh, plausible, all are equally difficult to prove, and I think we're still in the dark about it. So regardless of the reason, allergies are getting worse. But don't let that keep you behind closed doors. Use these common sense solutions so you can still enjoy the great outdoors. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Great advice. Up next, we're hearing the inspiring, true story behind the new faith-based film, Miracle Season. And welcome back to CBN News. Hollywood shines a light on the power of faith in the midst of tragedy. In the new film, The Miracle Season, it's the story of how one girl's faith-filled life inspires her volleyball team, her school, and all of Iowa City. Ephraim Graham has a look at the true story behind the film hitting theaters today. There's one student on Iowa City West High School's Wall of Fame who really stands out. Hi, I'm Caroline Found. I'm a 5'8 setter. Caroline Found was the heart and soul of the girls' volleyball championship win in 2010. So loved, her memory pushed the Trojans to an unexpected second championship in 2011. Caroline died that year in a bike accident on her way home from church, making it a painful and trying season for the girls to even play. I noticed you're holding a picture there. What's sure. That? That's a picture of Ellen and, and Caroline yeah. that I just kind of hang on uh, at special moments. We sat down with Caroline's dad, Ernie Found, and her coach, Kathy Bresnahan. As a coach, when did you realize you had a big story here? You know, I think we all just did what we could the whole season. And like, you know, after the season was over, I sent this in almost a non-addressed letter to Frank DeFord because I respected him as a writer. And I just sent it to Frank DeFord, Time Warner, New York City. That was it. And I, it, for me, it was just cathartic to write because I was so proud of my players. And it was the first time I felt like I could really let my emotions out. Yeah. And he got it and called me. That call from the celebrated sports writer led to a national story on the small town Iowa team, a book by Coach Kathy titled The Miracle Season, and now a major motion picture. And I heard this annoying voice in my head, Caroline's voice. Do work today, son. With everything going on in her life, she played volleyball. With Oscar-winning actress Helen Hunt playing play Coach volleyball. Kathy. Yeah. How difficult was it to come back to work after that mm -hmm. and, and to, to motivate the girls to get back at it? My job as a coach was to help them through. That was it. You know, whether we ever stepped on the court in a uniform again, my job was to help them heal. And, and so that's why we approached each day. It was hard. It was twice as hard for Ernie. His wife died of pancreatic cancer not long after they buried their daughter. Ernie, um, you lose your daughter and you lose your wife within weeks. At one point, we hear your character in the film say, God hasn't exactly shown up for me. And then at another point, we hear you say, I think it's time for me to express some long overdue thanks. What happens in the transfer? Yeah, uh, quite honestly, uh, God hasn't shown up for me. Uh, that was Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a script. That was never something that entered my mind uh, because I felt uh, his presence in a variety of ways. Can I interject quick, through. too, because the night of his wife's visitation, mm -hmm. you know, and he said, I'm so sorry, Ernie, and he just grabbed me and he said, Brez, my life has been blessed. So he felt God was there the whole way. He never wavered from that. Yeah. I think it's time for me to express some long overdue thanks. I'm so angry. I know. But to have had the life that I did with Ellen. You know, those are 17 years. Caroline. I know. 
What were you thinking for the volleyball team after your daughter's death? What were you hoping to see? I just wanted them to uh, hang together and keep on going. I think uh, that's what Caroline would have wanted them to do, is to keep on going. If we run the board, we got a shot at state. You mean to win? <laughs> I mean to win. We could win. For Lyme. For Caroline. Danica Yaroche plays the role of Caroline. Erin Moriarty plays her teammate and best friend, Kelly. Uh, either of you volleyball fans before this? I mean, I definitely <laughs> liked the sport and, like, respected it. Uh -huh. um, but I was not, I, I hadn't watched much of it at all. To be completely honest, I really didn't know much about volleyball. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I grew up playing multiple sports. Uh, I am a fan of, of sports and athletics. But uh, I had no idea what went into volleyball, no. how intense no this idea. game was, how how incredible these athletes athletes are. You know, these girls are all just like strong powerhouses. Yeah. And the game is so intense, but it's also so there's there's not really a sport like it because it's it's so encouraging and so supportive and it's really all about teamwork. You strong women got us here. You did this. I have never to be a coach. I love all of you so much. What do you think this would mean to Caroline, both of you? Because she seems so much larger than life in terms of how she was portrayed in the film. She was larger than that in life. Wow. She really was. I mean, every 20 years or so as a teacher or every decade, you find that one really special, unique person, and that was Caroline. Mm -hmm. None of it's exaggerated. She was that special of a kid. Love conquers all, uh, and and there's nothing more important in life than than relationships and and family. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Los Angeles. More than four thousand families had an extra special Easter when a church in Texas blessed them in an extraordinary way. The Covenant Church in Carlton, Texas, donated one hundred thousand dollars to an organization that purchases medical debt on the on the pennies on the dollar. Through their donations, more than 4,000 families had their debts paid off completely, totaling close to about 5 to $10 million. Okay, folks, that's it from all of us here at CBN News. Have a great weekend.